Okay. Hi, everybody. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. I uh, just as a reminder, this session is being recorded. Um, if you haven't done so already, take a moment and introduce yourselves on chat and thank you again for being here. I'm pleased to welcome our guest speaker, Justin Wright, Professor and Director of the MIT Teaching Systems Lab and author of the new book, Failure to Disrupt, Why Technology Alone Can't Transform Education. Please join me in welcoming Justin. Thank you. Great. Um, wonderful to see you all, especially those of you who I have seen recently in, in previous JWell events. Um, if you have a second to, to introduce yourself in the chat, that's uh, very helpful to me just to say a little bit about who you are and where you're from and uh, what your role or, or connection is. Uh, so I'm a former high school history teacher and I um, ran a consultancy that helped K-12 schools integrate technology into their teaching and learning. And then when uh, edX and MITx and HarvardX got started, I was an early researcher on those initiatives and now I run a lab at MIT that looks at online learning, particularly for teachers. Um, we have a new course, which we just launched through MITx um, called uh, Civic Online Reasoning, which I'll give you a link to. Um, uh, and then, uh, although, you know, um, for the most part, since March and schools uh, shut down around the world, me and the other folks in the MIT Teaching Systems Lab have spent an awful lot of time trying to think about what the transition to emergency remote learning looks like it means and how we can best support that. We have a whole range of resources that are and, and research that's available at tsl.mit.edu slash COVID-19. And what I want to talk to you about today is a book that actually has just sort of got its worldwide release and its Kindle release today. It's called Failure to Disrupt why technology alone can't transform education. Uh, it's a book that I've been working on for about five years. So it uh, is a, a product of the pre-pandemic era. Uh, in fact, the, the final page proofs were due on March 23rd or something like that. Um, so, the, so the last edits and the prologue were written uh, right as schools were shutting down, right as we were in the midst of uh, this transition. Um, and it's a book to some extent that's a history of the you know, a kind of a recent history of education technology, uh, particularly around one slice of education technology that I call learning at scale, learning environments with many, many learners and few experts to guide them. And it's uh, somewhat nerve wracking to submit a book that that talks about the past in an effort to guide the future right before pandemic because you could sort of imagine like oh well, oh my gosh what if, what if everything that i am about to submit looks foolish in light of the pandemic but uh but i think the book has held up reasonably well um and uh, and we can talk a little bit about why um what i hope to try to do somewhat today is to give you an introduction to some of the ideas of the book, some of the ways that I've thought about technology over the last 20 or 30 years, and then to have that suggest how we might think about, uh, you know, what's the right role, what, it, what, how, do, how do we explain the role of technology during the pandemic, and then what the right role is. Um, I usually can do a reasonably good job sort of keeping an eye on things in the chat. It doesn't mean my eye contact will sort of waver from you periodically as I have to look down to see what you all are typing. Um, but feel free to post questions or raise your hands and the moderators can uh, can have you jump in as, as we're going along. Um, and maybe I'll do this in two parts so that there's sort of a logical breaking point um, for some discussion in the middle. So when I think about the last 20 years, one of the things that strikes me most is the really remarkable claims that education technology evangelists have made about the power of technology to transform educational systems over the last two decades. Um, so Clay Christensen, a Harvard Business School professor and colleagues, said that um, he wrote in 2019 that by, uh, he wrote in 2009 that by 2019, half of all um, six to 12 courses would be online or blended, um, that they would be a third of the cost of traditional courses to offer and they would have better learning outcomes. When MOOC mania uh, got rolling in 2011, 2012, Sebastian Thrun uh, of Udacity 
said that there might in 50 years only be 10 institutions of higher education in the world, that, that most of the teaching and learning functions of schools would be aggregated into a handful of mega universities that produce learning experiences for the whole world. Um, Sal Khan in a 2011 TED Talks uh, argued that we should use video to reinvent education, that students should spend a bunch of their time sitting individually at computer terminals, uh, having a sort of adaptive, personalized learning experience. Um, and then there, if there was a role for teachers, it would be to sort of periodically grab a series of students uh, and to have them do some kind of project-based learning together or to offer some individual remediation when the computer tutor wasn't working well enough. Um, but that a considerable portion of education could just happen um, independently, anywhere, anytime, any place um, through these uh, through these adaptive tutors. And then uh, Sugata Mitra, who's the winner of the 2013 TED Prize, uh, sort of went beyond all of these points and saying we didn't even need schools, we didn't even need uh, learning institutions. Really, all kids needed was a laptop and an internet connection, and they could teach themselves anything. Um, you know, I'd invite all of you with parents at home, you know, all of you who are parents of children trying to do remote schooling right now um, to consider those last two claims, you know, how effective has it been for a child to sit in front of a laptop and, you know, proceed independently through an algorithmically guided experience or simply to search the web and study any topic for themselves. Um, and, uh, and I think those claims haven't held up particularly well. Uh, you know, so in, in 2020, after a decade or two of these kinds of claims, um, the world is blighted by a terrible pandemic. 1.6 billion learners in K-12 and higher education are, are go home. And, you know, to some extent, one might think that this would really be the moment for education technology, for learning at scale to be able to shine. You, you know, one thing about all those previous claims is that they all suggest that education technology is on the cusp of overtaking the existing education system, that we're, that we're very close to being able to, um, to, to beat the norm with education technology, to have, to have better outcomes, better learning experiences than what traditional schools can offer. Um, and once the pandemic strikes, the equation changes to some extent, because now education technology doesn't need to be better than regular school. It needs to be better than a hobbled educational system trying to hastily put together some version of Zoom school. Um, and I think despite that, for, you know, everyone is having a different experience in the pandemic. Um, there's, there's a range of responses and experiences out there. But I think overwhelmingly, people are finding their experiences learning through technology to be somewhat disappointing. Um, and in fact, the you know, I would say that there are two technologies that have really dominated our experience during the pandemic, and they're two of the very oldest technologies that we have. Um, so if you, were to, if you were to give awards for the, the two most commonly used tools during the pandemic, I think one of them would be learning management systems. Um, learning management systems were theorized in the 1960s and 1970s. They were commercialized in the 1990s. They were made open source in the 2000s. And they, for the most part, allow um, students and teachers to pass documents back and forth uh, between each other, um, sometimes with a little bit of auto grading, with a little bit of scheduling, some forums, some other things, but mostly they're sort of document passing. Um, and then, you know, overwhelmingly, the technology, uh, you know, that I think is most characterized the experience for anyone who's able to maintain a steady internet connection is what in the 1930s when it was introduced was called video telephony um, and which we now call video conferencing. Um, so what we've seen in the pandemic, you know, is not a kind of blossoming or flowering of lots of different novel technology approaches, which has been waiting in the wings to lead towards a transformative era of online learning, um, but rather, you know, an extraordinary display play of conservatism. You know, in, in, in higher education, it, it, to me, it's really felt like um, professors sort of walked away from their lecterns at the front of lecture hall. They sat down in front of their webcams. And as much as they could, they kept teaching as they would before. Um, K-12 has had a, 
a somewhat different experience. I think in most secondary schools, something similar to that has happened. Um, and then all of this has been sort of particular, particularly disastrous for our youngest learners because our youngest learners um, lack the fine motor skill, the executive function, the attention, all of these kinds of things to be able to participate effectively in, uh, in online learning. And so whether we, we like it or not, we've been forced into a kind of coached homeschooling. Um, you know, so two of the most common findings in education technology over the last 30 years have been demonstrated during this period that, uh, you know, that despite, you know, major changes and all kinds of things happening in the world, um, there are a couple of things which seem to appear over and over again in education technology research and the history of education technology that are helpful here. Um, when teachers get access to new technologies, they primarily use them to extend existing systems. If you, if you wanted to make any kind of guess about how teachers will encounter a new technology or encounter a new system that uses technology, one of the safest bets is that their starting place is gonna be returning to things that feel really familiar to them. And we have research on that that goes back to the 1980s. Uh, so Judith Sandholtz and colleagues led a project called the Apple Classrooms of Tomorrow, which was some of the first research done with personal computers in K-12 uh, classroom settings. They bought a bunch of fancy Apple IIEs for all of the um, students in a class, and they hardwired uh, a network with, uh, with uh, phone cables between all the computers and um, tried to provide support for people to create um, really different kinds of learning environments. You know, what would the, what could the classrooms of tomorrow look like? And the classrooms of tomorrow almost always initially looked like the classrooms of today with a little bit more efficiency or some typing instead of writing and those kinds of things. Um, it's, it's, it's not a critique of teachers necessarily. Um, maybe there's a critique in there uh, systemically of, of the conservatism of educational systems, um, but it's quite hard to learn how to do new things. One of the things that Sandholtz found is that teachers have a developmental process to be able to do more innovative, different kinds of things with technology um, before they can make some adaptations to what they're doing before they can try truly innovative new things that wouldn't be possible without technology. They typically start by using technology to do the things that they were already doing. Um, and that developmental process takes a bunch of time. Um, it, it can take um, hours and hours of professional development. You know, if you had asked me in January, how long would it take for a group of faculty to be reasonably proficient at doing one new thing with technology, to um, you know, empower their students to search online more effectively to conduct research or to use technology better for formative assessment in classes. I would say, well, the research tells us that it often takes teachers about 40 hours of professional development unfolding over a period of months to get good at a thing. Um, and here we are asking teachers to, um, you know, in many ways, substantially revise their practice in all kinds of dimensions while they have to teach their own kids under their feet at home. Um, so it's, it's a big ask that we have for teachers. And I think bringing, you know, one of the things from the history of education technology is that they're, they're not these profound moments of disruption. When change happens, it's steady, it's incremental, um, and it depends quite a bit, not so much on the exact features of the technologies that are introduced, but on the kinds of learning experiences that adults in a community can have about implementing new technology. Um, you know, uh, uh, one of the hardest things about doing the work of introducing technology into schools is that it's sort of hard enough to manage all the logistics of getting new devices or getting new software into the hands of teachers and students. And that's really only the very most preliminary step. Um, the next step is supporting teachers and students and other stakeholders in a learning process of doing things differently. And then, you know, a second finding that could, you know, that I found very useful in guiding almost any analysis of education technology is that sadly, the most innovative new practices are most likely to happen in places where, where learners are um, from affluent communities and homes or where the setting um, has a whole bunch of resources uh, to support the kind of learning that happens there. Um, there has often been a hope over the last two decades uh, that education 
technology could democratize education, that there would be ways that, well, affluent people already have all of this stuff. So if we can just get these new technologies in the hands of poverty impacted learners, then we'll see them accrue the same kinds of advantages as others. Um, and this is one of the oldest stories in education technology. Um, my, my book, in some ways, you know, aspires to build on the work of a great historian at, at Stanford named Larry Cuban, um, who wrote a book called Teachers and Machines, which really traced the history of uh, early technologies like radio and film and television and personal computers into schools. Um, and Larry in his book has this great picture of a group of children standing around a radio receiver. It's one of these radio receivers that's about as big as a small boy or a small girl. Um, and the caption of the picture is, um, with radio, the underprivileged school becomes a privileged one. And the idea was, is that now that we have these radio receivers, we could have, you know, elite teachers um, broadcast the world's best lessons directly into the homes of poverty impacted children. Um, and their schooling would be transformed. Um, and as you all know, um, there are certainly ways that radio has advanced people's learning, um, but it did not uh, close opportunity and achievement gaps between more and less affluent students in schools. Um, you know, nor did film strips, nor did television, nor did the earliest personal computers. And unfortunately, what we see during the pandemic um, is all kinds of ways in which the underlying inequalities in our system are revealed and then exacerbated. So, you know, so by some estimates, there are 15 million um, students in the United States out of about 57 million students who don't have good access to the internet to be able to learn. Um, uh, a, a reporter uh, who spoke to me just released an article yesterday that the, that the entire Bureau of Indian Education, the, the Bureau in the United States that provides uh, schools for many children on Native American reservations, um, maybe as many as 60,000 students, um, failed to buy any new laptops this semester. Um, and so their, their students don't have computers for doing this work. And those access problems are severe, but they're actually just the beginning, because it's also the case that even once people have access to the technology, um, the ways in which new technologies are used um, to support learners from different backgrounds varies quite a bit. Um, an enormous concern that I have right now um, is that in this sort of synchronous Zoom school that we're doing, um, the, the behavior and bodies of black students in America will be policed in, in, and sanctioned in ways that white students are not. So I'm, I'm sure people have seen all kinds of rules popping out about, well, you can't eat while you're in Zoom school and you can't, uh, um, you have to wear certain clothes and you have to keep your camera on and you, you can't be in your bedroom, you have to be in a living room, even if you don't have a living room and those kinds of things. Um, and I'm sure that we'll find a year from now um, that we punish and sanction, you know, black and brown and Native American students in the United States more than we punish and sanction white students uh, for the same kinds of subjective infractions. Um, and so, you know, we need to be conscientious of how these technologies not only are accessed by learners from different backgrounds, but how they're used to support or punish students from different backgrounds across these kinds of systems. Um, you know, these, again, these are patterns that we've seen over the last 30 years, um, and we will continue to see them now in the pandemic and into the future. Um, so one starting point for thinking about how to address the circumstances that we're in is to think about, you know, what kind of mindset or stance should we take towards new technologies? Um, and, um, I think there are, there are, you know, even some of the sort of leading advocates of new technologies are some of them starting to change their stances towards what technology can really do. So millions of people have watched Sal Khan's 2011 TED Talk. I think far, far fewer have read his uh, January 2019 interview with District Administrator Magazine. So District Administrator Magazine is this tiny little trade magazine for superintendents in the United States. Um, and Sal Khan gave an interview. We're looking back on, on his prediction to the past. He says, you know, now that I run a school, and one of the things about Sal Khan is that he started a, a physical school um, outside, you know, in, in the suburbs of Silicon Valley. It's a private school. Um, I think the tuition is 20,000 plus a year. So, so it, you know, largely supports um, affluent students. Um, and he says, you know, now that we have a school, it's some of the stuff is not as easy to accomplish compared to how it sounds 
theoretically, it's taken me and Khan Academy a long time to realize this, but not everyone can replace, um, you know, do self-paced learning overnight. And so then he makes this claim, you know, more recently what we're seeing is that we should look at um, Khan Academy as sort of a complement rather than a transformative tool in schools. Um, that, uh, you know, he, he suggests that teachers should teach four days a week about the way they usually do, and then one day a week use Khan Academy um, as, a, as a supplement, as a partner to that. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, he still has a sort of optimistic spin on it. You're gonna see pretty dramatic improvement. It's the best of both worlds because it's both doable and makes things better. Um, I think there's, some evidence across the field of adaptive tutors that that kind of model can work. Um, that the sort of, you know, do things mostly the way we've been doing them, but one day a week um, use computers for some independent practice. Um, part of the reason why I think that sounds like a good idea is that it's really a quite old one. Um, so down at Carnegie Mellon University, my colleague Ken Katinger um, in the mid 1990s wrote a paper called Intelligent Tutoring Goes to School in the Big City, um, where he did what um, Sal Khan proposed. Um, he, uh, he developed a, a, an adaptive tutoring system. He put it into three schools in the Pittsburgh school system. They tried to get people to do three days a week of regular teaching and then a two days a week of practice. It turned out that, that in the end, most teachers did about four days a week of regular teaching and then one day a week of independent practice. And the outcomes were modestly better, um, not transformative. You know, the schools in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, many of, some of which still use these tools, do not have dramatically transformatively better math outcomes 25 years later um, than other schools that are not directly supported by Carnegie Mellon um, and, and similar uh, advocates of adaptive tutors. But I think, you know, this is a valid approach to math instruction and it works a little better. Um, one way you could summarize, you know, Khan Academy's path of discovery um, is that, you know, they've had something like $150 million of philanthropic support over the last 10 years. Um, and they use that to discover, you know, what you could have found with a, with a trip to the library. Um, that new technologies um, can fit into educational systems in certain targeted kinds of ways, um, but they're not necessarily, uh, uh, you know, universally transformative. So I, I think there are, well, so, so one of the ways that you can then summarize these two perspectives and think about them in terms of stances to take towards new technologies um, is, is here are two ways that you could think about the, the role of technology, you know, here in the pandemic and then moving on to the future. And one of them um, we could call the charismatic stance. So I draw this term um, from Morgan Ames, who has a great new book called The Charisma Machine about one laptop per child. Um, and the charismatic stance, um, like sort of 2011, Sal Khan argues that technology has the ability to disrupt, to transform, to reinvent, to radically reconfigure education systems, and that the future will be brand new and different because of technology. Um, you know, if a giant pandemic were to strike, we would all do teaching and learning really differently because there's all these new technologies that are available to us um, to reconfigure systems of education. Um, and then a second approach, which I actually think is more like sort of 2019 SALCON, is what we might call a tinkering stance. Um, and Morgan Ames draws this term tinkering from uh, a book by David Tyack and Larry Cuban called Tinkering Towards Utopia. Um, and in this view, you know, it's not, new technologies don't disrupt existing systems. New technologies are domesticated by existing systems. Um, the systems have, you know, a, a series of stakeholders with complex relationships towards each other, a series of competing interests existing in a political context. Um, what we ask schools to do is enormously complicated. We ask them to teach math and how to read and how to speak a foreign language and how to exercise and how to tie your shoes um, and how to um, not have sex or if you do have sex to do it in certain kinds of ways, how to have healthy relationships, how to um, be patriotic towards the state, how to be critical of the state. Um, uh, you know, how to operate technology operating systems so that you can log on to things, how to remember your passwords. There's lots that we ask schools to do. Um, and 
teachers have to make decisions within the context of these complex competing interests. Um, and these complex competing interests lead these systems to be somewhat conservative because if you try to move things too much, um, you disrupt a whole, you, know, you, 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 you tug on a whole series of competing interests um, that make it hard for, for things to move. And so it's much more common that technologies get slotted in to existing routines and patterns. Um, so if you believe all that, then it's better to think about the future as an extension of trends from history um, rather than as, you know, on a fulcrum of some kind of disruptive or transformative break. You know, and I think the people in the 2010s who are imagining technology as potentially quite transformative, you know, one one way that we might explain their thinking uh, is that technology was transforming other sectors during that period of time. Um, journalism was being completely reconfigured. Government services were moving online in new kinds of ways. Um, the adoption, uh, you know, the music industry completely transformed. Um, the, you know, retail, uh, our relationships with one another, you know, the word friend meant something different. Um, you know, dating got moved online. There were all these other sectors that were moving quite quickly in different directions because of social media. And there's something to be said for trying to understand why education didn't move in that same direction. But as I've looked at education technology over the last 20 years and thinking about the pandemic and moving forward, I've found this tinkering stance to be much more um, constructive, much more grounded in reality um, than the charismatic stance, the notion that we can use new technologies to improve systems, um, but it's not something that happens in, uh, in, in big sweeps. It's something that happens iteratively, incrementally, over time with a shoulder to the wheel kind of approach to it. Um, so I think there are two corollaries or two principles that follow from this tinkering stance. Um, one of them is that it's important not to see learning technologies as all purpose. And I haven't found the right metaphor for, for this, but I think charismatic technologists often see technologies as bulldozers or Swiss army knives, as things that can sort of move whole swaths of the education system. And more often, it's better to understand the technologies we develop as sort of very distinctly shaped pegs um, in a vast landscape of differently shaped holes. That, that's hard. That's a hard challenge to say, you know, our technologies are going to operate differently in the first grade than in the 12th grade than in a graduate program. They're going to operate differently in early language acquisition and later acquisition and in computer science and in earth science and in physical education and in math and in different parts of mathematics and teaching computation versus teaching reasoning. But I think as hard as that is, it's still the best way to generally speaking, think of education technologies. They do particular kinds of things. And because they do particular kinds of things, they don't often lead to sweeping kinds of changes. And then I think a second issue, which the charismatic technologists often misinterpret, and I think is particularly important for this moment, is that learning technologies are not a switch that you can flip on and off. We don't take tools and put them in the hands of communities and expect things to be profoundly different. To the extent that we do improve teaching and learning with technology, some of it is the introduction of the technology, but lots of it is about the question of what kinds of supports are provided to members of that community to learn better with these tools. How do we support children? How do we support teachers? How do we support families? How do we support other stakeholders? How do we let people go through this developmental process where they have time to take new tools, to first imagine how they could do traditional practices with them, and then have some kind of incentive and some kind of support to try to do more ambitious kinds of things with them. Um, and so, you know, Fiha asked this question, how do you think technology can be applied in real life for teaching during a pandemic? And unfortunately, the answer to that question is so local and so particular to where you are. The answer to that question is going to be entirely different for someone who's trying to teach first graders to make sound letter mappings than it is to someone who's trying to make sure that 800 um, young men and women can learn introductory physics in a technology school. Um, some, some general advice for thinking through all these kinds of problems that comes through with that 
is to recognize that, in, that one thing that will probably be common to all of those circumstances is that when people have access to new technologies, their first intuition will be to do the kinds of things that they were already doing with them. Um, if you were getting really good learning outcomes before the pandemic, then, and you've got good connectivity and good connections, then that might be great. Um, if you are, are working in an environment in which, um, uh, in which the learning outcomes before the pandemic were not at a place that you wanted them to be, um, then it's unlikely that simply the introduction of technologies will lead to dramatic changes um, or, or, or dramatic improvements. You know, but a few sort of go-to ideas, if, if this community is really important, if the, if the ways in which people have opportunities to learn with one another about what the possibilities of technology are, you know, then that suggests that we need to really think about our work in introducing new technologies to improve learning as a partnership. We need to listen to students and to our faculty colleagues and to the folks that work with us and say, you know, how is this working for you? What do you think we could be doing better? What would improvement looks like? What are you most excited about? What's not working for you that we should change? Um, we should think about making sure that we prioritize um, our connections with each other, you know, which are now almost entirely media-based technology as not just opportunities for direct instruction and assessment, but opportunities for relationship and community building. Um, if, if what we need to do is to learn together about how to interact and learn, then we need to have, you know, then relationships are going to be foundational to that effort. Um, and that, you know, we need to bring a kind of iterative incremental developmental approach to this. It's going to take time for faculty to get better at doing new things. Um, it shouldn't surprise us if in the first few months of this new academic year, if things look a little messy and they look pretty similar to what we were doing before. Um, but, you know, I, I think one of the most, one of, one of the parts of this developmental process, one of the most exciting things is that people slowly over time um, recognize, oh, there are some new and different kinds of things that we could be doing here. There's some things that work really well. I'll give you two examples that are sort of interesting to me. Um, my wife teaches in the material science department at uh, MIT, um, and they have a lab class that they do. Um, and one of the things that she was saying is that, that for some of the labs they do, um, there's really just one or two pieces of machinery that are really essential to running this lab. And in the past, when they did the lab, you would have all the students sort of crowding around the machine. And some of them would have a good view of it and some of them wouldn't. And now they're recording those labs um, and they're putting the camera in the perfect place to observe what's happening. And now everyone has the best view of what's happening there. Um, I have a second colleague who teaches Photoshop um, uh, to secondary age students. And uh, she's teaching both in person and remotely. And so whether they're in her class or beyond, she has everyone logged into Zoom. Um, and she's found, uh, you know, it's really easy to get someone else to, to share their screen with her um, as she's teaching Photoshop. Um, and it used to be that she used to have to walk around and not everybody could see what she was talking about because she's just looking at one particular laptop, you know, and she was saying, oh, you know, now I'm just going to have everyone do this moving forward because... Uh, because she's learned a practice which is kind of marginally improving um, what it is that she was trying to do before. And, and I think lots of that discovery and innovation is happening. And it's not discovery and innovation that's gonna dramatically um, reshape teaching and learning um, in, in all kinds of brand new ways. Um, there's still gonna be lab classes, there's still gonna be Photoshop classes, um, but, uh, but there are improvements that are happening uh, uh, along the way. Um, so um, maybe I'll pause there for a second because what I can do sort of in the, um, in the remaining 20 minutes or so, if we have more time, is I can talk a little bit, you know, one, one of the claims that I've made is that if you want to understand what the, what the present and future of education technology looks like, it's really helpful to understand the past. And I've given you one sort of look at the past, which is to say um, there are folks who have brought these sort of charismatic, um, transformative, evangelical um, approaches and rhetoric to, uh, to technology in schools, and they have not, their predictions have not been as good and their guidance has not been as good as those that have taken more incremental, moderate, shoulder to the wheel kinds of approaches. Um, but there's lots else that we can learn from 
history. But let me pause there for a minute and just see if uh, if there are any other questions that folks want to add um, or uh, um, so here, so Judell has this question. Um, good. So, so Judell said, we've been observing what you've mentioned, that teachers are merely putting things that they have been used to, uh, albeit on an online platform. We designed a very self-paced experiential learning process, but student and teachers are having a hard time adapting to this. Um, and there's lots of good reasons to believe that students in particular will struggle to adapt to online learning. Um, one of the things about online learning is that it it puts us at a physical distance from one another. And there are, and there are lots of people to be sure who thrive in that environment. Um, but there's all kinds of things that we do in school buildings that we take for granted that are really helpful and important um, for learners. Um, schools are environments that are designed to focus and constrain our attention. Um, when a third grader lifts her head up in a classroom and sees that everyone around her is doing independent practice on a worksheet, um, and then the teacher sort of sees her head pop up and gives her a kind of smile, but it's a smile which is like, a, what exactly are you doing or thinking about smile? Um, that little girl is very likely to go, oh, well, everybody else is working and this teacher is looking at me funny. Maybe I'll just put my head down and keep working on whatever it is I'm supposed to do. When that same girl is at home and lifts her head up, there's like a refrigerator full of snacks in the corner and there's a Nintendo Switch to play with and there's all these other apps and things that she can do on her tablet. There's all kinds of things that can invite her to go in different directions and we can imagine the same thing with students in a lecture hall. Not that we maintain perfect attendance and, and, and focus and attention in those environments, um, but there's all kinds of supports that we provide in these places. Um, and online learning requires a degree of, um, you know, self-directed learning of attention and focus that, you know, unless you have a full-time caregiver kind of tutoring you through it is, is really hard, you know, not just for young learners, um, but for learners of all ages. One of the things, you know, we've never asked um, as many people in the world to do as much of their education at a distance as we have right now. And we're going to learn some strategies that work to provide those kinds of attentional, motivational supports. Um, you know, I'm hopeful that some of the things that feel really hard and rocky right now will feel less hard and less rocky in a month or two. Although some of them for sure are, you know, are going to be albatrosses around our neck. They're going to be things that, that still don't feel great uh, a month or two from now. Um, because, you know, as I said, it, it's a developmental process for everyone involved. It's going to take a long time for us to get better at teaching and learning these ways. You know, if, you, if one possible silver lining of all this is that I, I do think there's lots that we're going to take away from pandemic learning. I think we're going to have a whole generation of students, um, many of whom have developed some important independent self-regulated learning skills that are going to serve them well throughout their lives. There's going to be a whole bunch of teachers um, who have, you know, a new set of tricks and tools that they can use, even when I think we will primarily snap back to, to in-person teaching. Um, you know, Antonio asks, technology now provides connectivity, not only broadcasting, doesn't this change the scenario? Can we give more space to deep level learning asynchronously, synchronously? Um, absolutely. The challenge is that it's very hard to have people develop new practices as they're adopting new technologies. Um, let me skip ahead to, in, in, in part one of the book, I'll tell you this briefly. In part one of the book, I suggest um, that there are three genres of large scale learning technologies. There are things like massive open online courses or independent self-paced courses that are sort of guided and sequenced by instructors. There are uh, adaptive tutors and cognitive tutors, intelligent tutors that are guided. The sequence of learning activities is guided by algorithms. Um, and then there are other environments in which peer communities set the kinds of possible sequences of learners to go through. Um, that we can find examples of these three genres in all kinds of places over the last 60 years since we've been using computers to try to teach humans. Um, that we, that and they actually are fairly stable genres. They use similar technologies. They have similar pedagogical approaches. When we do research about them, they have some consistency in the outcomes that we find from them. You know, just like Sal Khan discovers in 2019, some things that we had discovered in 1997. Um, so if you can understand what these three genres are, um, you can look at new technologies, new, new entrants and say, oh, um, 
here's what the history of instructor guided self paced learning tells us. It's very hard for learners. In particular, it's very hard for our most vulnerable learners who are least well served by education, by, by formal educational systems. Um, these are the kinds of, you know, opportunities and problems that will emerge when we shift to a more self paced, um, you know, instructor guided set of learning experiences. But the the second half of the book looks at four kinds of problems, um, what I call four as yet intractable dilemmas. Um, and one of them is very much related to Antonio's question, and it's the curse of the familiar. Um, so the curse of the familiar is the idea that um, one of the things that we can do with new technologies is we can build things that digitize existing experiences in school. Um, one of the most uh, widely used technologies for learning in the United States and in the world is a tool called Quizlet. Um, and Quizlet helps you make online flashcards. If I showed you Quizlet right now, you would instantly recognize the learning experience there if you've ever used a flashcard. Because, you, you know, you just go, oh, well, I just put questions on one side of this digital card and I put answers on the others and they make little stacks and I can share them with people and so forth. Um, and it's spread very, very widely. And part of why it's spread very widely is that it's instantly recognizable and it digitizes a routine that we are almost universally familiar with in education. But of course, if we were to ask, like, you know, what's really going to be transformative about teaching and learning during the pandemic, I don't think any of us would say, oh, well, if we can digitize flashcards, then we'll see really different outcomes. You know, there's a sort of huge dearth of flashcards in schools, and now we have a chance to fix that. Um, by contrast, though, when we build things that are really different, when we build things in which we say, oh, we want to try to promote new forms of deep level learning through synchronous and asynchronous models that are going to be different than what people have seen before, but really powerful, um, oftentimes learners and educators find those new technologies and those new modes confusing. Um, when we do things that are, when we try to introduce new practices through technology, um, folks have a hard time with that, understandably, um, particularly if it's something in which they're required to learn. So kind of an amazing thing is when, um, when learners learn things that they're really interested online, they're often quite sophisticated at developing new practices using new tools. You know, when we look at people, how people learn to, you know, style their hair or do their makeup or beat levels in a video game, or um, I've just taken up mountain biking. So I've been watching a bunch of mountain biking videos and, and uh, seeing what people say in mountain biking forums and stuff like that. People, people are quite good at pursuing that, that uh, you know, interest driven learning independently online. They have a much harder time with um, pursuing school subjects. So when we make technologies that invite people to do really different kinds of teaching and learning, um, people often find it quite difficult. So the, the tools that have been most successful, the programs that have been most successful at introducing new ideas through technology have typically done two kinds of things. Um, one is they introduce a technology in a way that feels familiar, but then invites lots of different kinds of activity. Um, so I point in the book towards a, a tool called Desmos, which is an online graphing calculator. And uh, at, at its face value, it sort of does everything that a TI-84 graphing calculator would do, except it's free and online. Um, but then once you sort of master some of those simpler functions, you realize there's this like whole suite of other things that you can do of creating visual representations of mathematics that are interactive that people can learn with a new way. So there's sort of a pathway from the familiar to more novel practices. But then perhaps most importantly, um, if we want people to use technology to do new kinds of things, it just has to be complemented with substantial professional learning opportunities for educators um, and sort of guided and scaffolded learning opportunities for students. Um, if you give people Desmos and say to them, hey, in theory, you can do a bunch of amazing new things with this, they won't intuitively do that. I mean, a handful of folks will, a handful of people will discover that or see a couple examples. But most people will need a lot of time, a lot of guidance, and a lot of support. Um, and so if we want to see new kinds of practices emerging during this period, um, we're going to have to make substantial time available for professional learning for educators. That's quite challenging right now um, because people's lives are overturned by the pandemic. We can't be next to each other to do this professional learning. Um, there, there are all kinds of obstacles to that. So, but, but you know, the way through the curse of the familiar 
is, is through seeing technology as scaling, not by distributing new kinds of tools that allow new things, um, but by distributing and supporting um, communities of people that are capable of introducing new practices, perhaps inspired by the availability of a new technology. Um, um, there's another great question here in the chat um, from Gabriella about rural schools that don't have lots of technology access. Um, this is another. This is connected to another um, of the sort of as yet intractable dilemmas in the second half of the book. I call it the EdTech Matthew effect, um, which is that um, we often hope that new technologies will have the capacity to democratize education, but in fact they often um, end up. Uh, disproportionately benefiting affluent learners who have the financial, social, and technical capital to take advantage of new innovations. So it's not only um, that in rural areas or in low-income areas or, or in urban areas which don't have access to broadband because of a kind of digital redlining, um, that there's less access to tools. But even when there's access to tools, um, there's there can still be sort of social and cultural exclusions. Um, so I think there have been, generally speaking, two kinds of approaches to this. Um, one is to say, let's do everything we can, no matter what, to kind of do school at home. Um, so if the, you know, if there's no computer access, if the best thing that we can do, you know, we like we we have worksheets inside school. Let's photocopy those worksheets and send them home, and ask people to do them themselves, and and send the worksheets back, and we'll correct them. You know, that's sort of a school practice, which is well established in the routines of schools, which is theoretically possible to bring into homes. Um, and you know, I think some of the problems that people have noted with that approach are that. Um, those kinds of worksheets and paper packets are not the most dynamic or interesting or motivating or effective tools that we use in schools. And they're even less effective when they're sort of isolated from the rest of the practices that are around them. Um, usually it's not, you know, school is typically ideally not just piles of worksheets, but it's worksheets and conversations and meetings with teachers and, you know, um, uh, whole class instruction and all those kinds of things. So an alternative approach is to try to do at home the, not to do school at home, but to do the kinds of learning environments and learning experiences that are more likely to be effective at home. Um, so one uh, approach to that is to think about like, what can we do with television? Um, so even homes that don't have broadband access often have television access. Um, in some countries, uh, folks are using television to broadcast lectures and instruction. Um, and I think that combination of radio and television plus paper packets is probably better than paper packets alone. Um, there are also a handful of places that I think have said, well, if we're gonna do television at home, you know, is our, our lectures from teachers really the best television or is there other good kind of television? So in the United States, I actually think we're in the midst of a kind of golden age of children's television. Um, for mathematics learning, the public broadcasting system have some really fantastic television shows. For you know, they have Odd Squad and Peg Plus Cat and Science. There's Sid the Science Kid. Um, another thought is to say, you know, this children's television programming. It's high interest. It's uh, you know, it 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 embeds. Uh, learning experiences into narrative over multiple shows. It repeats and revisits some of these key ideas. A bunch of it is very well researched in terms of its efficacy. Um, you know, I mean, if, if it were up to me and I had a choice between, you know, having a group of young students do 40 hours of paper packets or watch 40 hours of Odd Squad and Peg plus Cat, um, I would I would bet the farm um, that the students who did the children's television were in much better shape mathematically five years or 10 years from now um, than the students who did paper packets. And then the other approach that I've heard people talk about is to say, what are the kinds of learning experiences that are well supported at home? Um, early in the pandemic, I was interviewed by a reporter from the North Slope of Alaska, um, where villages are connected by float planes and connectivity is really bad. Um, and other teachers in that community were saying, look, this is not a good time to try to do school. We, you know, we can't, we can't fly paper packets to people, um, but it's a great time to learn Inupiaq values. It's a great time to learn how to cook and to sew and to um, beat and to hunt and to fix a snow machine. Maybe we should have students trying to learn the things that can happen best at home. And then when schools get going again, we'll catch them up on what's in school. Um, that's, you know, in, I mean, in some ways, 
that's not a great answer to the question a year later. You know, clearly what we'd like to see is around the world, people have universal access to broadband, um, to have universal device access and to have, you know, governments around the world that are actually effectively managing the pandemic, which is not the case in the United States. Um, but given all of those constraints, I think, you know, in places in which, um, you know, we're, we're trying to recreate school at home in ways that just aren't working for students, we ought to think about what are the ways that we can do at home, the kinds of learning that are, that are most effective at home. And this connects to Ed's question on Cape Cod about, you know, these sort of enormous difficulties of uh, supporting students that, um, you know, are, are, are working from the same room, don't have sufficient internet access, all those kinds of things. Um, and I think, you know, there's no, there's no silver bullet answer to those very difficult questions. Um, but the things that I do keep going back to are, to what extent are we partnering with students and, and families to address this? To what extent are we asking, you know, I, I think the question is great, like what's working? Um, what will be particularly helpful is to ask students what working and what's not working for you to ask uh, families that question to um, have ongoing dialogue, you know, with people and your teachers in your particular community about what's working and what's not. Um, and then, uh, um, you know, and then to realize that relationships will be foundational to addressing these issues that, you know, we're going to have to be partners with folks in overcoming um, some of these challenges. And then also to have a lot of grace with ourselves and with our students, um, that if we as a society don't provide sufficient supports for young people to be able to learn and thrive during a pandemic, um, then there are just going to be limits to, you know, we're, we're, we're educators, but we're not miracle workers, um, you know, and, and so I think we have to, you know, if our, if our students don't have um, safe places to work and the sufficient resource to be able to do that, then we have to ask our communities and ourselves, you know, not so much as educators, but as citizens, um, why have we allowed ourselves to get to a point where our supports for children and their family um, are, are so brittle uh, that we find ourselves in a circumstance where where you know, during the kind of emergency, which because of climate change is just more and more likely to occur, um, there's going to be more pandemics and there's going to be more environmental disasters um, and there's going to be more interrupted schooling. And we need to, you know, work together to build a society uh, that does support learners through those very, very difficult challenges that, you know, obviously to Edward, that's not a, um, you know, I wish, I wish the answer was, you know, do X or do Y, um, but a lot of it is, you know, trying to keep connecting with kids, partnering with them, um, building relationships with them and their families and asking them um, how to help and how to support. Um, so if these kinds of ideas are interesting to you, um, I'd invite you to keep discussing them uh, with us. You can read the whole book. You can go to failuredisrupt.com and the book is now available uh, worldwide and, and in the US and on Kindle um, for, or in an ebook copy um, from all of your favorite uh, bookstores, including your local independent bookstores through, uh, through Indie Shop and through Bookshop. Um, and then if these kinds of conversations are fun for you, we're having them every uh, Monday at 3 p.m. Eastern time, failuredisrupt.com slash virtual book club. And even if you're sleeping uh, during that hour, you can get the recordings afterwards. Um, next week, we're gonna be talking about adaptive tutors with Neil and Christina um, Heffernan who founded Assistments. And then the week after that, we're gonna be talking <clears throat> with Natalie Rusk and Mitch Resnick about uh, peer guided learning environments and about Scratch. Um, so it's been a real pleasure to be able to chat with you all today. Um, I'll let my colleagues from JWell uh, give us a parting benediction. And for all of you who are wrestling with these many, many challenges of making uh, learning work with the pandemic, you know, my hat is off to you and my heart is with you. And I, and I hope that you find the JWell community a place where we can continue to, to delve into and get some, get some guidance and some insight on these very difficult questions. Thank you, Justin. Thank you for being here and um, talking about your book. Um, for everybody, um, thank you also for coming and joining us today. Um, thank you for getting up in the middle of the night for those of you that are on the other side of the world. We appreciate you attending.